flesh and blood, body and soul. No one makes something alive. So it makes a body. And the body is something we reflect on in the teachings of St. Paul, who speak about the church as the body of Christ. And so it is here, even as we reflect on this place, we do celebrate the dedication of a building. And this consecration of this building, as we see here indicated by the consecration candles lit today, and the crosses there that were anointed by, by a bishop and set aside then for the, entirely for the worship of God 21 years ago. And we celebrate the dedication of this church 121 years ago. This is a place set aside by God from all eternity where he'd be worshipped and where people of faith would come and encounter him and know him like us. So we see it is a place, a, a physical place, but in, in, in vivified by the presence, by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what makes a place a sacred place. This is what Jesus is speaking about with this woman at the well. And he leads her through an understanding of what it was going to mean to worship God as a Christian. First, he speaks about her worship. He doesn't say it's entirely bad. He acknowledges that she and her people worship God. But he says that you do not understand and if we understand something about the Samaritans, the Samaritans were related to the Jewish people, but they did not accept all of the Old Testament as we understand it, but only the first five books. And really, their image of God, their understanding of God is formed really by Genesis. If any of you have read through Genesis, you see they did not understand God the way Moses was going to understand him yet. They don't understand God the way we understand him. They understood God, their God of the Hebrews, to be the greatest God, to be their God. And so the Samaritans understand in this way, in this fashion. It's not perfect. They understand God to be the best, to be their God, but in their temple, on a local mountain, is then not only a worship of their God, but also others. You get the impression just in case. And so Jesus says, you, you worship what you do not understand. And you are tied to this place, to this mountain. It's something that comes from your heart. Something that's naturally from your heart. Which is good, but what we have in Jerusalem is better. Because on Mount Zion in Jerusalem, we worship God that we understand. The God that was revealed, not by our own desires, but by Him, by the Word. By the, the appearance to Abraham to Moses, and through the Holy Spirit speaking through the prophets, we worship a God we understand in the place that he set apart so that we, enlightened in mind, then can, can call out to the true God. But then he says, there is a time to come, and indeed is already here, in which worshipers will worship God in spirit and in truth. And he's speaking about the church. Now, in one sense, we can say in its simplest sense, and it's true, the incarnation breaks the mold of the temple so that you can have the temple everywhere. Jesus is the temple. And so you can worship God everywhere, in all churches around the world, at all times of day, from the rising of the sun to its setting. You can worship God according to the way he has set out. This is true. You have a priest who could also worship then in another place to bring the sacraments to the hospital or to go with a group of young people to the mountaintop and offer mass there. You could do all those things because we worship God in spirit and in truth. We live in that eternal temple. But that's not just about where to say mass, but that reality of that eternal temple that we, though we do not yet see with the eyes fully of the, of the spirit, the eyes of faith yet, we still see with these weak eyes that only see what's around us, we should not forget that we have died in Christ. And just as the saints and angels live and worship in that true temple, the heavenly Jerusalem, and honor the Lamb, so do we. 
that we live in that. The time will come and is already here. And it's true for us. The time has come and it is already here. That we worship God in spirit and in truth. That our natural desire to worship God is there like the Samaritans. We understand what is revealed. So there's that truth and that conformity to the truth in Christ. And there is in spirit. It doesn't mean without structure. In the spirit means that in baptism, God has changed our soul. So although the image was there before, now we are more like him. Now we are like him in a, in a supernatural way that enables us to do wonderful things like have the audacity, as, as one way of translating Latin, the audacity to call out, to stand up and call God our Father. When we use the analogy of the body, it's, 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 it's difficult. It's easier to fall back on the structure, the structure, the hierarchy of the church, its magisterial teachings, or the church building itself. And that's not bad. Body and soul, we need both. We are made this way. But we have to understand that that spiritual reality is the most important part. But the two must coexist. And so, what is it in the church... How can we understand perhaps this in a, in a, in a way that would, that's, that would be clear for us? The Lord uses many natural examples in his own teaching. He speaks about the mustard plant. He speaks about the flock of sheep. He'll speak about the vine. And maybe it's the vine that is the best way to understand what the church is whether it be the church universal, this building, or our own lives of prayer. What is it? The vine, where do we find a grapevine? But in a vineyard. We all recognize, I hope, living in Oregon, what a vineyard looks like. We can recognize a vineyard even if it doesn't have a vine growing because of the trellises, that there's a structure there. Now, grapes don't need trellises to grow. They can grow in the wild. But they don't produce as much fruit. They could grow in the ground, but they would rot. Not produce as much fruit with the, the wet leaves and, 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 and the grapes dirty upon the ground. The terraces produce, raise them up and allow the vine to have light and the proper amount of moisture. Without the trellises, there will not be as much fruit. And so what are the trellises? The trellises are planted by God too. Just as the Lord called to his people in Abraham, just as the Lord established the temple in Jerusalem and was later in Christ to establish the church, a real church, a structure that he foresaw would include hierarchy and buildings and places of worship, our traditions and our teachings. Those trellises are key. So that the vine, him, might have a place to grow. And indeed in our life of prayer, a life of that structure that we give the Lord, the structure of the sacred liturgy, the structure of our prayer, the structure of our rosary, of our reading, of our reading of scripture, of our giving time to the Lord. This place where the Lord grows in our hearts, that the vine that was planted in baptism might have a place to grow and to flourish. But that's that spiritual part, the vine. And he makes of us the branches upon that trellis. This is a key, key for us to understand not only the church, but the way we fit in, the way what we must do to recognize that we need this structure and we need to allow the vine, allow Christ to flourish so that the vine and the branches grow and to bear the fruit necessary for our salvation and that of the world. And that structure is that structure of prayer, of following of Christ, of giving that time both in what's necessary in words and time, but also then of reflection and silence. So for us then, we recognize all of these things as we celebrate and remember those who founded this church, those who have worshipped here for that last 121 years, those who worship here now, 
for us and for our families to ask the Lord that this trellis of his sacred body may continue to stand and endure, but more so that the vine ever grows and spreads its branches throughout the world so that one day all the world becomes that vineyard of Christ bearing the fruit of his divine love.